Hello, I'm Neil Clark. I'm a postdoc in the lab with Abby Mayan here at Mount Sinai. And my contribution to this series of lectures is to tell you about some statistical methods for approaching high dimensional data. Now, in this two part lecture, I'm going to tell you about a method called gene set enrichment analysis, which also goes by the name of the acronym of GSEA. Gene set enrichment analysis is a method used for extracting biological insight from gene expression data. I'll begin in this first slide by giving you the overall picture of how this works. Now, microarray experiments measure the expression of genes in the, on the genome scale. Typically, tens of thousands of genes are measured in a single microarray experiment. One way that microarrays are used is to make a comparison between two biological states, diseased and not diseased, for example, and to compare the expression measurements to gain insight into biology and to learn something about the disease, for example. Traditional methods look for individual genes whose expression is different in the two classes of samples. But often this approach has two associated problems. Firstly, it may happen that no genes stand out as being differentially expressed, at least none stand out above the noise in the data. Or alternatively, many genes may stand out as significantly differentially expressed, but then we find ourselves in the position where we have a, this large number of genes with no obvious way to interpret the list and derive meaningful biological insight. GSEA attempts to overcome both these problems by looking not for individual genes, but for whole sets of genes that are collectively differentially expressed. This has two advantages. Firstly, it, it can increase statistical power. Small but consistent changes throughout a whole set of genes are liable to stand out above the noise much more clearly than individual genes. Secondly, if the set of genes is chosen carefully, such that each of the genes in the set are related biologically, then the biological interpretation is built in to the approach. In the first part of this two-part lecture, I'm first going to go through a few mathematical preliminaries. A knowledge of these is not strictly necessary for you to perform GCS, gene set enrichment analysis, but I think that if you're well acquainted with them and you have some knowledge of the statistical test that inspired this method, then it will stand you in good stead for understanding how gene set enrichment analysis works and also how you can interpret the results. So this first part will be spent looking at random walks in one dimension, which are essential for understanding the kolmogorov smirnov test. This is the statistical test that inspired gene set enrichment analysis, which retains much of this test of goodness of fit. In the second part, I'll take you through gene set enrichment analysis by applying it to a small example data set, during which you will be able to see all the inner workings of the method. Okay, we're going to begin with random walks in one dimension. This may seem a little abstract and unrelated to our ultimate aim of analyzing gene expression data, but I hope you'll stick with me to see how this builds up. Let's begin with a regular one-dimensional lattice, which you can think of as a line with an origin labeled zero, and a series of equally spaced points labeled one, two, three, four, and so on, going to the right, and minus one, minus two, uh, and so on, on to the left. And to perform the random walk, we start at zero. Then, with discrete time steps, we take a step in a random direction, left or right, with equal probability. As we repeat these random steps, we can chart our progress by plotting our position on the lattice against the time. As the top figure shows, this results in a jagged line. In the bottom figure, we have let the walk go on for much longer, and as you can see, the fluctuations take place on a wider and wider range of scales. If we take the limit that the length of each step tends to zero while the number of steps taken tends to infinity, then the walk becomes what is termed a Wiener process. A related type of random walk is defined by fixing the endpoints to be at zero. One way to make such a, a walk would be to take some number of right steps and an equal number of left steps, then randomly permute them then start at zero and follow the randomly ordered steps. Because there's an equal number of left and right steps, you must end up back at zero. If you take the similar limit that the size of the steps goes to zero as their length goes to infinity, then the walk becomes what is called a Brownian bridge. One question we might like to ask about a Brownian bridge is, 
In the course of the process, what is the maximum distance I am likely to stray from zero? Mathematicians have answered this question by calculating the probability distribution. This is shown here in the equation at the bottom of the slide. I'll now just quickly define what I mean by a probability distribution. A random variable is just that. It's a variable which takes on random values. Which particular random values it is likely or unlikely to take is described by its probability distribution function. The probability of observing a random variable to have a value in the range between the values b and a is given by the area under the function between those two values. Written uh, in mathematical notation, this is the integral and is shown in the first equation here. An example of a probability distribution function for a random variable distributed as a Gaussian with a mean of 1 and a variance of 0.5 is shown in the upper figure on this slide. The fact that the function peaks in the vicinity of 1 can loosely be understood as meaning that the range of values in the vicinity of 1 are more likely to be observed than other values. The cumulative distribution function is related to the probability distribution function. The values of the cumulative distribution function at x, say, tell you the probability of observing the random variable to have a value of less than or equal to x. This can be written in terms of an integral of the probability distribution function as shown in the last equation on this slide. The figure on the right shows the cumulative distribution function corresponding to the probability distribution function in the figure above. Notice that at small values of the dependent variable, the cumulative distribution tends to zero, and at large values, the function tends to one. This is just as you would expect, because for an extremely small value of x, it is unlikely to see an even smaller value, and for an extremely large value of x, you are sure to see a value of that size or smaller. The Kolmogorov-Smirnov test is a statistical test which was the inspiration for gene set enrichment analysis. And as we will see, it works on a similar principle. The kolmogorov smirnov test is a means of addressing the question of whether some data are consistent with a given cumulative distribution function. To put it more explicitly, consider some random variable which has a given cumulative distribution function. Then, we make several observations of this variable, samples, and plot the distribution function of our sample. Because we can only take a finite sample, random fluctuations will mean that the distribution function for our data will most likely differ from the true distribution function by some random scatter. The kolmogorov smirnov test is a way to answer the question of whether the difference between the two distributions is just random scatter, or if there is a real difference between them. It is a test of goodness of fit. Some properties particular to this test are that it is useful when the sample size is small, as there is no binning with the data. OK, we'll now work through an example of the kolmogorov smirnov test by using a simple example. Suppose we take some measurements of a random variable and obtain the numbers shown here. And we want to test whether these numbers are consistent with this variable being drawn from a Gaussian distribution with mean 1 and variance 0.5. The first thing we do is plot the cumulative distribution functions for the data and the distribution we want to compare it to. These are shown in the figure on the top here. Notice that the cumulative distribution function for our data, as we move along the horizontal left to right, takes a step up every time you reach a value that is in our data set, such that the resulting stepped curve indicates the fraction of our data points which have a value less than or equal to the value on the horizontal axis. So we have a jagged, stepped, cumulative distribution function for our data. This will smooth as you collect more data. And we also have the completely smooth Gaussian cumulative distribution function to which we want to compare. I'll let you into a little secret here. I did actually draw the data points from the Gaussian. That's why the two curves do seem to be quite similar. But we're going to make an objective a statistical test of the similarity between these two with the kolmogorov smirnov test. The basic idea of the kolmogorov smirnov test is that if there is no real difference other than the random scatter between the two cumulative distribution functions, then the difference between them should just be a random walk. But as the endpoints of every cumulative distribution function are fixed at 0 to the far left and 1 to the far right, 
then the endpoints of the random walk will be fixed at zero. So we should be looking at a Brownian bridge. The lower figure shows the difference between the two cumulative distribution functions. As you can see, it tends to zero on the left and right. And in between, there are some fluctuations. Just by eye, this curve looks like the Brownian bridges we looked at earlier. So it's looking promising. But how do we quantify this judgment and make it objective? Well, remember how I said that the mathematicians had worked out the probability distribution for observing any given maximum distance from zero in the course of a Brownian bridge? Well, we can use this to estimate the probability of observing the actual maximum distance under the null hypothesis that there is no real difference between the distributions. If we observe a maximum distance which is so large as to be very unlikely under the null hypothesis, then we will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the data is inconsistent with the comparison distribution. On the other hand, if the maximum distance is small and reasonably likely to occur by random scatter under the null hypothesis, then we will accept that the data is consistent with the comparison distribution. OK, let's consider another example. Take the data points shown here. We will compare them to the same Gaussian distribution. Again, in the figure on the top, we plot the cumulative distribution functions, and we might already become suspicious that there is something wrong. They seem to be a little different this time. In the figure on the bottom, we plot the difference between them, and this time we see the supposed Brownian bridge straying a much larger distance from zero. If we calculate the probability of seeing a maximum distance of this size or larger, we will see that the, it's very unlikely uh, if this really was a Brownian bridge. So we then conclude that this is not a Brownian bridge and there is a difference between the two distributions which is more than just random scatter. In the next part I will show you how all this relates to gene set enrichment analysis. But to conclude this first part I will give you the big picture of how gene set enrichment analysis is performed. First, the gene expression data from two different classes is taken and the genes are ranked according to their differential expression. Those genes which are most upregulated on top and those which are most downregulated on the bottom. We will then take a test set of, of genes which are known to be related by some common biological theme. These may be the genes which form proteins which are the members of a given pathway for example. And then with this gene set we're going to try to quantify the degree to which these genes tend to sit in extreme positions of the ranked list. In order to compare this quantity to the distribution we might expect by chance, we repeatedly perform random permutations of the data. In the next section, I'll flesh this process out in more detail using a simple example.